Holocaust survivors remain the core and driving force of this living museum. It is an honor to have Mr. Lesser with us this evening. When a survivor tells his story, he reasserts the very humanity and dignity that the Nazis attempted to destroy. Let me speak for everyone here in saying thank you for sharing your story with us and for doing it here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. Thank you so much. What a wonderful crowd. I'll tell you, I've seen this film many times, but every time, every time I see it again, it just makes me cry. And I'm usually not so easy to cry, but believe me, I live through every second of it. I hope you took, I hope you saw I, I, those, that death train with all those dead people because in my story, I'll get to that in a little while. You've seen a lot about my story, but there are certain incidences, and I, if I have the time, I wanna, would like to talk about. First of all, I started the Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation for one main purpose, to keep this world from acquiring amnesia. We cannot allow this to happen. And in order to do that, I speak in many schools and colleges, and I've done this for uh, now almost 25 years. I make sure that every listener walks away with one of those Zahor pins. Zahor means remember, and it most likely applies, mostly applies to the Holocaust. And I want to be sure that anyone listening to me walks away with that pin because it's more than just listening to a survivor. They walk away with something tangible in their pocket or in their hands, and I feel that someday I don't expect them to wear it, but someday if they put it in a drawer or in a jewelry box, they may have children eventually, and their children grow up and they find this, they'll say, mommy or daddy, what is this strange looking pin? There goes the story, oh, that means remember the Holocaust. There was such a thing as a Holocaust, and I listened to a survivor. This to me was so important. And to date, we have given out almost a half a million pins to listeners. I know that you all received the pin. If you didn't, there's some in the hallway there. And we also started, a, within the Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation, a project which is called I Shout Out. And this is so important because one girl asked me in the school one day, Mr. Lesser, what can I do? I'm just one person. What can I do to make this a better world? And that's when it dawned on me, and I said to her, well, you can shout out. Because in World War II, no one did that. Everyone was silent. No one cared what happened to the Jewish people but you can shout out. And after I walked away from there, I realized, what does shouting out mean? So she shouts out and it disappears into thin air. It's gone. And this is why we started at the Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation, this project of I Shout Out. We are looking for six million shout outs to compensate for the six million silenced voices. Now, every time you shout out, whether you shout out for tolerance or for equality against bullying, whatever it is, it remains on the website for generations to come. 
So your great-grandchildren will be able to punch in your name and your shout out will come out. And if you wish, you can even submit your photograph and your shout out where the photograph is gonna come out. And that's gonna be for generations to come. Now, when you shout out, it means something. It's a number and you can read your shout out. So I'm asking all of you to please help us Gather up those six million shout outs. Be the voice, be the voice for my parents, my brothers, my sisters, and, and all those many people who were slaughtered by the Nazis. I would like to point out the pictures of my parents. My father, Lazar Lesser, Scheidel, my mother, my little brother, Thule, my sister, Goldie, and my older brother, Moishi. None of these people survived. They were all slaughtered by the Nazis. The only survivor from a family of seven was my sister, Lola, and I. Lola passed away about two and a half years ago, I believe it was. Um, she was a wonderful woman, and she wrote a book too. Um, her book was, um, there, there is a life after this. There is a life after this. Beautiful book, and if you can find it, buy it. I strongly recommend. And while, while we're talking about, my, about books, this is the book I wrote, Living a Life That Matters from Nazi Nightmare to American Dream. We have it in book form or CDs form. Reading my book, you will know every answer or every question that you may have about the Holocaust is answered there. My book, I want you to know originally I just wrote a um, memoir so my family should know what happened to the rest of the family. How come there are no grandparents, no uncles, no aunts? But after I finished writing it, I tore it up into pieces. Because by that time, I spoke in schools and colleges for almost 20 years. And I knew what questions the kids had they needed answers. So I rewrote it more like a memoir, but it's also a textbook. And many schools, many, especially in Nevada, are teaching out of it. It's not in the curriculum, but any teacher that reads my book teaches out of it because it has everything that has to do with it. All the questions are answered. There's only one question that I can't answer, and that is why, obviously. This is the house where we lived. I think I'm going to take this out. All right. The house where we lived, the three windows to my right are where our apartment, and the last window, in fact, was my bedroom, and in 1939, September of 1939, this whole building was shaking. I ran to the window early in the morning around 5 a.m., and th what I saw were tanks rolling down the street, following the tanks, there were half tracks, and every few steps, the soldier would jump out of the half track, get on the sidewalk, and this is how they occupied the city, in Krakow, Poland. No fighting. Um, then the Wehrmacht with their, with their beautiful, well, shiny black boots and their goose steps. It was quite impressionable for a 10 and a half year old. That was my age at that time. Okay. This is part of the Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation 
what we do besides pins, I want you to know, we send teachers who would like to teach about the Holocaust, we send them to schools and to Europe so that they're being taught how to teach the Holocaust because we have to provide for the future. We will not allow the world to forget it. So this is one of the things. We also send um, graduating students to the March of the Living, where they spend one week time in Europe in the concentration camps, and they learn everything about what happened, and then they go to Israel, to Israel for one week. Yom Ma'ut. It's so important. It's a life changer to the youngsters. They walk away from there, and, and they're completely um, different. They realize that they're part of part of a Jewish people, and and they become interested, and they work for 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 the Jewish organizations. It's very important works that we do. Uh, can All right. This is a town, anyway, we lived in Krakow, but you, you know, um, I meant to tell you that the fifth day after occupation of Krakow, we realized Nazi brutality, what it meant. Early in the morning at 5 a.m., a truck pulls up to our gate, and they start banging on the gate. The super came running out with his shirt tails hanging out. They said, what's going on? What's going on? All they wanted to know where the Jewish people lived. And he was quick to oblige. He said, there's a family on one side, and on the other side of the building, the lesser's house. That's where we live. Well, they came in and they started, okay, one side was a Jewish family on the ground floor and we were on the other side. They came running down with sacks in their hands and pistol whipping everybody in bed. Throw in all your valuables into those sacks, money, jewelry, silverware, anything they saw of value. And they were beating up my father to open up the safe. While this is going on, my sister Lola, the one who survived, and I heard this terrible screaming from the other apartment. There was a young couple there, and they had two daughters. They were about my age, because after school we would play in the yard. But the mother gave birth two weeks earlier to an infant little boy. And the screams we heard of Lola, my sister, and I went through the back door, through the kitchen, and we came in. And this is what we saw. We saw this monster was holding the baby by its legs and swinging it and telling to the parents, make him shut up. And of course, everyone was yelling, our baby, our baby, don't hurt our baby. You know, you can see that this monster was enjoying it. And he smashes the baby's head into the doorpost, killing it instantly. It's a memory I could never forget because screaming baby in that, that sudden silence, how can you forget something like this? Everybody jumped on this monster, and of course we were all pistol whipped. And the others, I guess, they were a little surprised. It was only the fifth day after occupation. They were, I think the other soldiers were a little surprised themselves because they said, come on, Hans, let's go, let's go. They p picked up all their valuables that they gathered and they left. So this is what one incident. To let you know, my father had a business, wine and syrup. And he also had a chocolate factory, Pischinger Chocolate Factory. He was first to make chocolate-covered wafers in Poland, like Kit Kat. Everything was confiscated, ta taken away. So 
And meanwhile, an ordinance came out, came out that Jewish people can no longer reside in Krakow, but if they wanted to stay in the city of Krakow, they had to go into the ghetto. They made a ghetto. Well, it just so happened that Lola had had the young man who fell in love with her, and he came to my father and said, Mr. Lesser, you, you know how I feel about Lola. Someday I'd love to marry her, but please do me a favor, I'll take care of everything, let's go to the small communities that our family is going. And this is my future brother-in-law, his name was Michael. He rented half of that building, the other half was was the farmer, orchard farm, farmer who lived there. So on the way, we were being stopped by the Nazis, and all they wanted to know, do you have any books, Jewish literature? And then we saw a mountain full of books next to the road. They were going to have a bonfire. And it just so happened that we found out before we left Krakow that my father had 1,000 American dollars that he saved up for a rainy day. So he took a Jewish prayer book, he put it, pasted it inside, and he put it in those two sacks of books, and obviously they took it and threw it on that mountain of book. My sister Lola spoke a beautiful, beautiful German. As she walked up to this Nazi, she says, look, my father was a writer. He wrote his autobiography. Let him keep this one book. Maybe he liked the way she spoke, a beautiful German. So he says, OK, we'll give you five minutes. Well, you can imagine the whole family was climbing on this mountain. Well, we were chased away. We couldn't find it. All these books looked alike, black or brown and leather bound. We couldn't find it. So when my father came here, he had a family of six to feed. I also had a sister that was in Munkaj, which was hungry at the time, because my mother's side of the family comes from Munkaj. So she was caught when the war broke out with her grandparents in Munkaj. But the, there were a total of seven in the family, but six of us were with my father. My father is coming to this house penniless. How is he going to feed the family? Not like he can get a job. Jewish people were not allowed to be hired. So when my future brother-in-law, Michael, saw what was going on, he brought my father a sack full of flour, 100 pounds of flour. My father saw the flour, his face lit up. Instead of baking bread to feed the family, he started to bake pretzels. Why pretzels? All you need for pretzels was flour, water, and salt. And those ingredients he had. Then he went to the neighboring bars to sell these pretzels. It was a novelty, and he started to sell pretzels. And before he knew it, we became a baker in town. But it didn't last very long, because after about nine months, and meanwhile, Lola, my sister Lola, and Michael got married. And this was the marriage in the yard of that farmhouse. Um, the little boy is my little brother, Tully, next to my mother, Shari. And Lola, Michael are on top. I am the third person in that black or brown or blue. Uh, that's me. It was the on, that's the only picture they have of me at the age of 12. Now, the irony is of all these people that you saw in that picture, can we go back to the picture? Of all the people in this picture, only three of us survived. My sister, my brother-in-law, and, and myself. Everyone else in this picture was slaughtered. No one survived. So since 
oh, about nine months after we lived in that town, um, and Lola and Michael got married, they moved into a duplex. One side of the duplex lived the mayor of that town. The town's name was Nepolomitsa. Now the mayor tells Michael and Lola one day, Michael, I heard there's going to be a raid. Save yourselves. The minute Michael heard it, that night he hired a wagon with a driver, and we, whatever we could carry with us, we put on it, and we had to leave that town. A good thing we left, because the following night there was a raid, and thousands of people were actually taken to the forest, and everyone was shot in the forest. We didn't find this out until after the war, when we went back to that town. And some of the farmers who went to the forest to pick um, berries and mushrooms to sell it in the market told us about it. They said they, they witnessed and they were hiding behind trees how everyone was shot. And after they covered them up, they were telling us for Days, three or four days, the ground was moving. Those monsters didn't care whether they killed you or not. As long as you fell in there, they covered you up. OK, uh, I'm going to run out of time. My story is so long, so I'm going to skip a lot. We had to, the only place we can go with that wagon was a town called Bochnia. Bochnia had a ghetto. That meant we had to go into the ghetto. Now, going into a ghetto is easy. What we went through in this ghetto is too long of a story. And I beg you, if you read the book, you'll find out. But what happened is we were able to escape the ghetto. And Michael, my brother-in-law, hired a truck, a coal truck, and they paid him a lot of money to make the coal truck converted into a double-decker, where you have coal on top and the chassis on the bottom. Between the coal and the chassis, 10 people could hide. So myself and my little brother, went through and we were able to smuggle across the border from Czechoslovakia to Hungary. My sister Lola and Michael went through and when my mother and father were next in line with other people, uh, some Polish farmers saw what was happening. They called the authorities and everybody was pulled up. All 10 people, including the driver, which made it 11, were lined up against the wall and shot. But we were able to escape, and we got into Hungary. I got reunited with my sister, both of my sisters. My sister Lola and Michael, they were in Budapest. And my sister was a Munkaj with my grandparents, uncles. And it was quite a memorable day. And this was about still in 1943, near the end of 43. I don't remember the exact month. But when I told the people in Munkaj what was happening in Poland, most of them didn't believe it. And those who did believe said, well, this will never happen in Hungary because Hungary is an ally of Germany. So why would the Germans occupy Hungary? It didn't make sense. My uncle listened to me. My uncle, who was a wealthy man, he had a fabric store for selling fabrics for suits and dresses. And above the store, he had his beautiful home. I said to my uncle, I says, uncle, if the Nazis ever come into Hungary, all of those valuables that you have here will be confiscated. It would make a lot of sense if you can convert some of your assets into small 
tangible things that you can put in a pocket or hide it. And he listened to me. One day he comes home with boxes full of shoes, beautiful black shoes, a pair of shoes for every member of the family, and he tells us that in the heel of the shoes, there are diamonds. Only, only in a life-threatening situation should you know that you could save your life if you need to. There are diamonds in your heels. Well, it didn't take long. In March of 1940, March of 1944, the Nazis just came into Hungary like they were invited guests. Excuse me. They came in, they knew every Jewish person's name, address, where they lived, and their education, their businesses, everything. The question is, how? They didn't have computers like they do today. The answer is IBM. IBM had punch cards, and they provided these punch cards for the Nazis, IBM doesn't deny it, but they claims that they had no idea for what purpose it's gonna be used. So within one month's time, they came in in March, in April, the end of April, they were already shipping people to the death camps all over Germany and Poland. Excuse me. I Anyway, at this point, they rounded us up, and I guess you saw it in the film. They were telling us that we're being relocated to Germany, uh, able-bodied men and women will be working, children will be going to school, and older people will be cared for. Take along all of your valuables, they tell you, but leave everything else behind. Only what you can carry, and anyone found hiding will be shot. And they marched us out to the cattle cars. You saw that film earlier. Uh, where are you? Okay, can you move it forward a little, please? I don't know. Um. All right, so they marched us to the cattle cars and they put us in 82 cattle car, which you saw earlier in the film. They had two buckets of water and they didn't give us any buckets for uh, human waste. So can you imagine one day, two days, the third day, those buckets filled up and it was overflowing. It was a real mess. Now we were happy that we had bundles of those valuables that people brought to sit on top of the bundles instead of sitting on, in that human waste. After three days on the third night, we arrived at a place called Auschwitz. Auschwitz. And they lined us up uh, we saw Arbeit macht frei, they line us up, and they select us. Now, before I came, there was a man, like a doctor, he was going with his finger right, left, right, left, right, left. I didn't know who he was, but later I found out it was Dr. Mengele, the angel of death. He decided who shall live, who shall die, just by flick of a finger. And when I came close to him, I saw him ask a young man, he must have been about 20 years old, can you run five kilometers or would you rather go by truck? And this guy said that he had a knee problem, he would rather go by truck. 
poor soul not realizing that meant certain death. And this is exactly what and they put them to right, sent them to the right. But it didn't make sense to me. I was 15 and a half years old at the time. So it just didn't make sense. By the way, when the train arrived, it was nighttime, and I had my sister Goldie, my older sister, my little brother, and as they told us to get out and leave everything belong on, on the on the inside the cattle car, they said women and children to the right and men to the left. And my uncle and his son, my cousin, we all went to the left. But I, I was torn. Do I go with my sister, my little brother, or do I go with the men? I was 15 and a half. I wasn't a man and I wasn't a child either. I decided to go with the man because I figured if, they, if this is a labor camp, if they're going to make us work, they're going to feed us better working than otherwise. And I went with my cousin, cousin. And when I came forward to him, I told my uncle, whatever he asked you, be sure to tell him that you are strong. You can run if you have to. You can work, but let me go first. And I spoke German, so I went first. And <laughs> when, before he had a chance to ask me anything, I stretched myself out and I saluted him. And I said, 18 Jahre alt, gesund und arbeitsfähig. I'm 18 years old, I'm healthy and I can work. And he did ask me, kannst du fünf kilometers laufen? Can you run five kilometers? I said, yeah, well, he sent me to the left. I'd like to tell you a little more about Auschwitz, but I don't have the time. So I'll just tell you this much. I found out while being in Auschwitz that they expected the Hungarian influx of Jewish people from Hungary six months before Hungary was ever invaded. They, inspect, they, they expected it, and they were making the people dig ditches for fiery pits. They enlarged the crematorium. They enlarged the, the, the gas chambers because of the influx of the Hungarian Jews. They would know they would only have a short period of time to kill as many as possible. And I found out an awful lot of things, but I don't have time to tell you, except that what we went through there for two weeks, and then they put us in truck, and they took us for a ride in these trucks for about a day and a half. We arrived at a place called Dernhau. Dernhau was a labor camp. And what they have there, the, the, they had a rock quarry. As they dynamited the mountain and those boulders would come down, it was our job with sledgehammers to break them down to manageable pieces, throw them into mining carts, run it down the hill to a grinding machine to make gravel, push the carts up again. It was very hard work. But usually when you come back, from the work, they would line you up in the camp and count you again. One day we came back and they counted and they counted and they counted and they wouldn't stop. Then the commandant comes down with the Fräulein. He had a young, petite little woman with him and he says to us, I'm going to show the Schweinhund a lesson. I'm going to teach the Schweinhund a lesson so they'll never forget. Well, what happened? Apparently, three inmates escaped. And because of this, he orders his henchmen to pull out every third person, I'm sorry, ev pull out every tenth person in line to receive 25 lashes. So as they're counting, my uncle was in front of me, and I can see he is going to be a number 10. So I push him behind me, and I took his place. 
and they took us in the middle of the yard. They ordered his henchmen to bring down bundles of one by one hardwood, about two and a half feet long. And they also ordered him to bring down the sawhorse. And this is what they ordered us to do. Tiptoe, put your knee inside the opening of the sawhorse, bend over, but your stomach cannot touch the two by four. One man was holding your trousers real tight and the other one was doing the hitting and you had to count out loud. If you miscounted, they start from one again. If your heel touches the ground, any part of it, start from one again. If your stomach touches the two by four on top, you start from one again. Well, it was almost impossible, and I was number four. The first man went up, he, he counted and miscounted, and his heel touched the ground, he touched the two by four, and count again and again, finally he collapsed. Now every time they hit him, you can see a line of blood on, through the trousers, because these stakes were so sharp. Anyway, now, it was, he fell down. As he falls down, the commandant goes over and kicks him in the face. He says, get up, the Schweinhund, you there, get up. He couldn't. He pulls out the revolver and shoots him right in the head. They pull him away. Number two goes up. He too couldn't make it. He finally fell. He walks over and shoots him. And by the way, his girlfriend goes over to him after he shot him and gives him a hug and a kiss like he had just performed some kind of a heroic act. Number three. Number three was a younger man. And he took a few hits and then he started to yell out, please don't kill me, have mercy on me. So the commandant says, then get up, come over here and face me. He gets up, makes about three or four steps and his knees just gave up from under him and he fell. The minute he fell, he goes over and shoots him. Now it's my turn. I can't describe how I felt. I will tell you this much, I was the youngest. I was at that time about 15 and a half, maybe almost 16, I don't remember. But I remember walking up to this sawhorse, tiptoeing, bending over without touching the two by four, and I psyched myself out, I said, Ben, if you want to survive this, you're going to live another hour or you're, this is the end. You have to do exactly what they told you. And I remember tiptoeing, putting my knees inside, bending over. One man is pulling my trousers and they started to hit. And I count, eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Finally, twenty, one twenty, two and twenty, three and twenty, four and twenty, five and twenty. I made it. You could hear a pin drop in in the whole camp. No one expected anyone to survive this. When the man who was holding my trousers saw what happened. He says to me in Yiddish, he says, go over and thank the commandant. So I straighten out, blood is running down, and I walk over to him, I salute him, and I said, Danke schön, Herr Commandant. Thank you very much, Mr. Commandant. He puts his hand on my um, back of my shirt here, my back, and he twists me around facing those number 10s who are still to be beaten. He says, now I told you it could be done. If you do it like this, Junge, you have nothing to worry about. While he is saying that, there's a commotion at the gate. 
They caught those three inmates. But when the commandant saw that, that they were pulling in these inmates all bloodied, he, just like a child loses interest in a toy, he lost interest in us number 10. And he told us all to go back in our original line and he orders his henchmen to bring down a portable gallow and they hung each one of them on a separate, on, on that gallow. It was a single gallow. I'll never forget the third one. He was apparently a religious young man. And when they put the noose around him, he yelled out, Shema Yisrael Adushem Elekeinu. And when they heard it, they kicked the stool out from under him. They wouldn't let him finish Adushem Echad. They were such, such monsters. And after that, they dismissed us like nothing ever happened. And we got, got our rations. We went back in our uh, barrack. We took a shower. For weeks, I could not lay on my back uh, because of these welts. But thanks God, everything healed up in time. One day, we hear cannon fire. The front was closing in. As the front is closing in, that morning, we went, reported to go to work. There's a loudspeaker saying that the camp is being evacuated. No one is going to work today. The camp is being evacuated. Line up in rows of fives, and they marched us out. Now, I didn't tell you, but my uncle um, got another job because I gave the chef from the kitchen, I gave him those diamonds in my shoes. And he was able to give my uncle a job in the kitchen. My uncle was already in the kitchen working. And his son, my cousin, and I, the beaver ordered to march out. That was called the death march. Because if you couldn't con uh, keep up with the, with the uh, pace of the soldiers, you were simply shot. One week, two weeks. Week three, well, after two weeks, my cousin gets sick on me. And he tells me, he says, Ben, let me sit down in the snow, and everyone will pass. They'll shoot me. I can't take it anymore. It'll be over with. I says, no, this will never happen. Not as long as we are alive. I'm alive. We will survive this, both of us. Don't even think that way. And for another week, I was dragging him along. And finally, we arrived at a place called Buchenwald. Buchenwald was also a big concentration camp. They line us up, they count us, and they tell us to go inside, inside the camp um, barrack. And she says, you can take a shower there. They'll give you fresh clothes. But tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., you have to be back in the same place because Buchenwald is also being evacuated. While I was in Buchenwald taking a shower, some German must have taken a picture of me. I received this from... from uh, the person who, uh, who uh, made that film, The Liberators, they sent it to me because they thought in the cutting, they thought this might be me. And I believe it is me. I couldn't swear to it, but I believe it is me. Um, anyway, the following day, we line up, they count us, and they march us out. About 300 yards out of the camp of Buchenwald, we see cattle cars lined up again. A whole bunch of cattle cars. They count us 80 to a cattle car, and they tell us to go in. I tell my cousin, I'm going to help you, push you up. But go to the end of the cattle car, because 
and save a place for me because I remember going to Auschwitz. I was in between, in the middle, with people all around you. It was terrible. But this way we'll have a place to, to rest our back, which he did. And he found a place for me. They loaded up the cattle car with 80 people. They closed the door. An hour later, they opened it up. And they threw in 80 breads, a loaf of bread for each person. Picture this. Those people who were next to the door were grabbing four or five breads. I, on the other hand, with my cousin, we were against the wall there. We had nothing. We don't know where we're going, for how long we're going to be gone. We have no idea. So <laughs> I tell my cousin, I have to get a bread. And I started to climb over the sitting inmates, over their heads, to get to the door to wrestle out the bread. And as I'm climbing, somebody stabs me. I guess one of the inmates had a pocket knife, and he didn't like the idea that I was climbing over his head. He stabs me. I feel blood in my mouth, but I couldn't stop. I had to get the bread. So I continued, and this man had about four or five breads. I wrestle out one bread, and he punches me. I come back to my cousin. He says, Ben, what's happening? You're bleeding. And I put my finger here, and it went right to my tongue. To this day, I still have a mark, but I filled out a little. So it's over my chin bone. It used to be in the middle of my throat. Anyway. One week, I had this one bread, and I was, I don't know where I took that, that smartness to be able to uh, ration this one bread in the middle of the night where no one can see me. I would give my cousin the size of a half an egg, a little piece of bread, and I ate a little piece of bread like this. Now, one week, two weeks, and finally the bread was gone. People are dying all around me in that cattle car, dying everybody. Even those people who had three or four breads, they didn't have any water to digest it with. So people were dying. After two weeks, we're out of bread. It took another week till we arrived at a place, they opened the thing, Dachau. We didn't know where we are, but they opened up the doors and they yelled, anyone who can walk, walk into the gate of Dachau. Uh, that's when we, my cousin and I walked out. We were very, very weak because the last week we had absolutely no food. And I don't know how many people walked out with me. By the way, you saw that train. That was the dead train with all those dead people in it. And I walk out with my cousin. We went inside the camp. Three days later, we were liberated. You saw that. Liberation, liberation, America, and we were happy. Recently, I was asked to narrate a film, a documentary called Night Will Fall. And I asked to see a copy of it so I can get acquainted with it. And when I opened it up and I saw this dead train, I said, my God, this is the train that I arrived to Dachau with. And they said that only 18 people out of the 3,000 going from, from Buchenwald to Dachau walked out of this cattle car train. The rest, all the people were dead. Now, when I heard that, I called my daughter, Gail. She isn't here today. And I asked her, please, send an email to Dachau and find out who is still alive from that dead train. <coughs> if there were only 18 people, I figured, well, I was only 16 at the time. Most of them were in their 20s or 30s or 40s. She called Dachau, 
believe me, they have perfect um, uh, information. They keep everything information. And the answer came back, one person by the name of Ben Lesser. So to date, I'm the only survivor of that that came. Now, I, I just had an overview of what actually transpired, but it was much more than that. And it takes a book to write everything down because I'm here today and I can't believe that this is me. You saw those dead people walking, skeletons, that was me. I weighed 60 pounds, 60 pounds at the age of 16. So I was an absolute skeleton. My cousin is, is next to me and I won't let him go. They came and they took him away. And I followed. And as I followed, my knee, knees gave up under me and I collapsed. When I collapsed, they put me to the ball, the side. About four or five hours later, a man walks up to me, nicely dressed, and he asked me what language I speak. I said Polish, and he spoke Polish, and he introduces himself. He says, I'm a Jesuit priest, and I came here with nuns and doctors from France, and we opened up a field hospital in the yard of Dachau. I'm going to take you to that field hospital. He picks me up like a sack of bones, which I was. He puts me on his shoulder, and he carries me to the infirmary. And on the way, he told me something I could never forget. He says, Benek, you people paid a terrible price for just being born Jewish. What an awful price to pay. He says, however, don't you ever abandon your noble religion. And this coming from a Jesuit priest in 1945 was almost unheard of, especially a Polish Jesuit priest. But I never forgot it. And he brought me inside. There was a nun waiting. They had a cot with a sheet on it. They laid me down. She took my vitals, and I passed out. Two and a half months later, I wake up in a place called Santo Tillion. This was a monastery in Bavaria. And the monks gave up one building, like a hospital, to take care of the survivors of Dachau. So I wake up. I didn't know how long I was in coma. I had no idea. But when the nun saw me wake up, she brought a mirror to me. And I look at the mirror. I saw a pretty good-looking guy. I, I remembered myself as a Muslim man, a dead body walking. And here I had a little flesh. I guess in two months or two and a half months, I, I gained a few pounds. And what happened afterwards is a long story. But I, one day I hear songs. Heveinu shalom aleichem, artsa alina. And I look out the window. I'm on the second floor. And I see young boys and girls dressed in blue and white, and they're marching and singing in the monastery with Hebrew songs. I remembered as a child. How is that possible? I run downstairs, and I go to the madrich, to the person in charge, leader, the leader, and he, I ask him, who are you? He says, well, all these kids are orphans. They lost their parents. And we are halutzim. We have joined the halutzim, 
and their aim is to go to the land from where we were dispersed, Judea, which was Palestine then, and to get our country back. And what he told me, he says, the whole world stood by idly. They didn't care what happened to the Jewish people. If we had our own country, this would never happen. And it made a lot of sense, so I joined them. It took a few weeks before I got well enough to be released. They came and picked me up. I was with them. And I was with them for a few months, and, and suddenly, um, suddenly a delegation comes down from Palestine, and they picked out 10 kids to be the first one on the Aliyah Bet. Aliyah Bet means the first crossing into Palestine illegally, because if the British found out, they will arrest us. So, and I was one of the 10 who was chosen. I was very grateful. It was a big honor to be the first ones to go to Palestine. And the whole group that was chosen, this is the group, Chazak Viyamatz, this is the group. Now, with the fourth one on top, that was me, that young-looking kid. And uh, we were chosen. What a big honor. This one girl that I have my arm on top of her shoulder, Rachel, she got ill. And when she got ill, they took her to San Tertullian, to the monastery, which was now a hospital. So they put, put her there. Now I am leaving, and I had to go say goodbye and appease her that, you know, when she gets well, we will come and the delegation pick her up, take her back to Palestine. And I'm sitting on her bed for two hours because I had to wait for a bus to come and pick me up, facing her and talking to her. There was a lady in the bed next to her, and I saw her foot was in a slink. I didn't pay attention to her, but she paid attention to me. And when I left, this lady says to Rachel, Rachel, who was this young man with his wavy black hair? He reminds me so much of my brothers. So she says, oh, his name is Benjamin. Benjamin. We went by our Hebrew name because we were going to Palestine, obviously. Uh, she says, oh, I had a brother by the name of Bainish or Benek in Polish. Do you happen to have a picture of him? She says, oh, yes, I have this picture of the 10 of us who were chosen. And she shows the picture to this lady. The lady looks at it and she screams out, that's my brother, my brother, he's alive, he's alive. Imagine he was here two hours. Neither one of us knew the other one survived. That's Lola, my sister Lola. She was the most talented person. But she started to scream so loud, so her husband, who was in the room next door, heard, and he came running. He says, Lola, what's happening? She says, my brother, Ben, he's alive, he's alive. You have to get him back to me. I don't know where he's going. He's going somewhere to Palestine, but I don't know where. I... Now, I joined a group um, called the Hashomer Hatzair. I didn't know left, right, religious, not religious. To me, they're Zionist, and it, I didn't know the difference. So, but she did know, because we come from an Orthodox family, and she felt that once I'm in this organization, I will lose any kind of Yiddishkeit or Judaism. I'll forget about my background. So she swears to her husband, you have to find a way to bring him back. 
My husband goes out and he finds a cousin of mine. His name was just like mine, Bainish Horowitz, the ben, ben Horowitz, a cousin. And she, they bring him to Lola, and Lola swears to him, you go find my brother and don't you come back without him. Tell him that his sister Lola is alive and she is in a hospital in St. Atelian and she's dying. And her dying wishes to see her brother. Well, he doesn't know where to go. But Rachel remembered something about Frankfurt on Main, that we went to Frankfurt, and from there we would probably go to France, to board ship, but she wasn't sure. So he goes to Frankfurt, and he walks the street, back and forth, one hour, two hours, after three hours, he sees a bunch of young boys and girls speaking Yiddish. Oh, so he walks over to them. Do you know my cousin, Ben Lesser? Now, they knew me, but they were afraid to tell him because it was underground. Who is he, you know? So he begged them. He says, you know, he has a sister, and she's dying, and her dying wish is to see her brother. So they felt sorry. He says, okay, we'll take you to him. And they took my cousin to me, and he tells me the good news that my sister is alive. But then he lowers the boom. He says, you know, she's dying, and her dying wishes to see you. Well, I was happy that she's alive, but at the same time, my God, she's dying. And I have to go see her. How do you leave the first Aliyah Bet, the first crossing into Palestine? Um, people would give anything to be, take my place, but they couldn't replace me anymore. So I went to the person in charge, and I told him, he says, Ben, if you're thinking of leaving, forget it. You can't. I can't replace you. I says, but it's my sister. She's dying. Anyway, to make a long story short, blood is thicker than water, and I decided to leave. And I came back to St. Tertullian, to that monastery. Rachel is still in bed, and my sister is in next bed. Now, I, I'm very happy to, to see her and be, be embraced, and I see she is pregnant. I see her say, Lola, what I told you. She, so she left. She says, I knew that the only way I can get you back <laughs> was to tell you that lie. I am fine, but I'm expecting. I'm in my ninth month, and I'm expecting a child anyway. So I had mixed feelings, but at the same time, I was happy. I found a sister. She was she's healthy, and she's going to bring the first nephew and the mishpoche, the family, is going to start again to spite Hitler. So to me, it meant so much to have a new family beginning. Anyway, a month later, about three weeks later, actually, she started labor, and we took her to the hospital, and she gave birth, and my beautiful nephew, a beautiful nephew uh, was born. My, I forgot about the Chalutzim. I figured that this is important. We're starting a new family. And then, of course, we went to um, Munich, and we got an apartment there. And eventually, eventually, we came to America. My whole life changed. And to the good, I might say because I had two daughters, a wonderful wife, okay. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me. Uh, I could talk for another hour or two. I, this is my granddaughter, Robin. She's, she's telling me it's time to go.